Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Fellowship last week was rich. Thank you all for who made it possible for us to enjoy that time together. Um, welcome to our guests. We're grateful for any, anyone visiting us here for the first time. Today, um, don't turn to Romans. That just feels wrong, but I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at something different before we embark in Romans chapter 9. So if you're preparing for Romans chapter 9, just keep at it. You get another week to get ready. We have labored for two years in Romans chapter 1 through 8 if you're visiting. And before we now dive into chapter 9 through 11, I wanted to preach on a verse that, that I said I was going to preach on at least once a year after I preached it. And I'm very delinquent. It's been years. And I sense the Lord leading me to return to it this morning and so I, I kind of see it as a bridge to our next section. Uh, we're going to look at some truths that have proven to stir up hearts deeply throughout church history in Romans 9 through 11, uh, the sovereignty and God of God uh, over salvation, his work, how he's uh, just bringing about this beautiful plan of redemption. And it's just, this is just a good practical application then to Romans 1 through 8. How do I live in light of such a gospel, and that's uh, really married in this one verse. Let me just read it to you, Philippians 4, 5. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men, <clears throat> the Lord is near. And so this has always been a, alarming to me as I read it. The apostle Paul, the, the truth bearer, the exhorter, the one confronting and telling us to deliver people over to Satan, don't even eat with such a one professing Christ and living contrary. What should the world know us by, Paul? How should they think about Christians when they hear or think of us or see us? And so many things come to my mind and my heart when I ask that question, but not this one. Let your forbearing spirit be known by all men. This is how we're to be known by the world. And some of you have already started making excuses in your mind of why it doesn't mean that. Can't mean that. You're just cutting across my whole grain of life. Let me cut. I'm here to cut this morning. Some are like, no, that, that is not what we need today. We need bold men taking on the systems and the government and the world. Don't give me this mamby-pamby stuff, Pastor Murphy. Paul said to fight the good fight of faith, and I love a good fight. Romans 9, give it to him, Pastor. Why are you waiting? Club him. And so I look at the boldest, most courageous man I've seen in history next to Jesus Christ, and it's the Apostle Paul. And he writes and tells us what we're to be known for. And we're to be known for our forbearing spirit. And I don't think in my lifetime there's ever been such a pervasive spirit in the church of the complete opposite of what we're to be known for. And I mean, where, where's Romans moving? Chapter 12, therefore, I urge you to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice, which is pleasing and acceptable to God. And do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't act like it. Don't think like it. Don't live like it. That's the application to the gospel. Don't, don't get its spirit of the age. Don't have its desires. You live in this world, though you belong to another. And this whole world lies in the lap of an evil one. And his design is to conform your thinking to this system and its ways that are anti-God. And we have to fight to renew our minds to think God's thoughts in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And we're not to become the frog in boiling water and, and act like this world and think like it. And what we see today is the cancel culture. We just write everybody off, we're done with them, we're finished. The entitled culture, and, and thus an angry culture, a rights culture, get toxic people out of my life culture. And it has really seeped its way into the, into the church of God, where, where people have quit hoping and believing the way we're called to in 1 Corinthians 13 and one another where we persevere in relationships. Love never fails. We work through difficulties. We're, we're so not even equipped how to do that. I'm just done with you. 
I wonder how many of you are sitting in this building this morning, done with someone because of the way they act, talk, smell, whatever it would be. I really do wonder. It's the air that we breathe. Social media has just taught us how to come unglued on one another and lash out with no consequences. Pop and run. Pastors, the average they stay at a church is two years and the average parishioner is less than a year. That's not God's design. Don't be conformed to this world, but let your forbearing spirit be known by all men. I'm just going to ask you, maybe ask some friends, what are you known for? Maybe ask your neighbors, your people at work. I hate to get mean, but maybe ask your spouse. How about ask your elders? <laughs> or a really good one, go ask your children. What am I known for? Is your life just a path of broken relationships? Divisive, suspicion, conflict, short fuse. No one will confront you because you're just gnarly. Justification of why you can cancel them. It's so free, it's right, it's deserved, and, it, and it's sinful. And it's against all of God's design for what the church is to be. You want to be a city set on a hill in this culture? Let's start with this. Let your forbearing spirit be known by all men in a day and age where it doesn't exist anywhere. That's going to shine in a dark land. And that's going to make people say, what is the hope within you? What is different about this gathering assembly of aliens and sojourners? So I want to pray and ask God to not let our pride and our excuses get in the way of the Spirit of God and what He has to say to our hearts this morning. And I want you to hold still. <laughs> Let the scalpel cut this cancer from your heart this morning if it's in there. So pastor's coming. <laughs> no leaving during the prayer. This is me fighting for your good and God's glory. And I, I just, I'm just going to ask you to come and let the Word of God do its work in our hearts this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we look at some hard words, and it is the opposite of our culture. I'm afraid that we're being conformed to it, and so I ask that truth would come in and penetrate and cut off cancer if it is in our heart. God, that we would truly be these kind of men, women, and children. And so, Lord, you're the only one who can do this. You're the only one who can produce it. We look to you now. God, by your word, through your spirit, make us like Jesus Christ, who is the picture of forbearance. And I pray in his precious, beautiful name. Amen. <clears throat> Philippians. You want to talk about government overreach? Paul's sitting in a Roman prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, awaiting his sentence. Is his head going to get cut off or not? That's, a, that's the setting as he pens this letter. You would think his passion is, I need to rally the church. You need to fight against Rome. Stop the persecution of the bride of Christ. But strangely enough, Paul has a bigger passion than that. He has a passion like in Philippians 1.20. He says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. My, my passion is that Jesus Christ is put on display. I'm rejoicing because the gospel spreading through the whole praetorium guard. I'm just redeeming this opportunity that I have upon me. The church is shining as light in the midst of it. That's what I'm, that's what I'm after. And I'm, I'm more concerned about your forbearing spirit. In chapter 4, where we'll take up this morning, Paul is concerned about the church's stability. It's stability in the midst of all of these enemies. And so this is big as in our day and age, everything just seems so unstable. And Paul is saying, while all of it seems unstable, I want you to be stable. Let, let the world be unstable. Let it fall apart. Let it all come, come crashing down. You remain stable like a rock. 
I love when you, you see the, the ocean coming over the rocks and it covers it and then it washes back and that rock is unmoved, not being tossed to and fro by every wave, moving with the current of society. That's what Paul's concerned about for the church. Be stable, be steadfast, be immovable. In my study this week, I came across a, an illustration from, from a gentleman who said what Paul's doing in this chapter is uh, stabilizers. Stabilizers on, on planes and ships, they have these. And on a plane, the back fin is to stabilize the plane as it flies. Is curtsy here? <laughs> Help me, Greg. <laughs> is that true? The stabilizers on a plane? And there's not a fin. <laughs> it's, it's, what do you call it? We need pilots that fly these things. And the more the turbulence, you need a fin. The stronger the stabilizers must be. So when you're living in our culture and what's going on now, you need a stronger stabilizer. We need some. And they need to be deep, internal stabilizers. And what we've done the last two years is we've been running around looking for external stabilizers instead of the internal ones that God has given to make us steadfast when all these waves and turbulence are all around us. We have so much coming at us on a daily basis. And it's been tough the last few years watching the collapse of our country in many different ways. And we can read it all uh, every day, all day with our, our phones and computers. And it's just news that's coming constantly of what? Instability, instability, instability. And it says to my soul, I need a stabilizer. I need a stabilizer in the midst of all this turbulence. And look with me in Romans 4.1. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm in the Lord. Don't you love commands like that? Stand firm. <laughs> how? I can command you till the cows come home. Stand firm. That doesn't do much for me. I need to know how. And some of you right now are in a huge battle to stand firm in the Lord. And I'm praying this morning that you'll get some beautiful answers. And I, I want to start with the big picture. The big answer before we jump into this verse these big overarching truths and realities to take on smaller day-to-day -day things. Things like Romans 1 through 8. Big, massive, eternal truths and realities of what God is doing. And so how do I fight my fear of the future? Whether I will make it through all of this turbulence, all the charges that are so heavy against my conscience and the condemnations that we learned and that God's love will fail. We need massive bedrock answers like we know that God causes all things to work together for good. And those whom he foreknew, he called, he predestined. All, all of those bedrock answers are just huge. And that's what Paul does here. Uh, he says, in the Lord, you need to stand firm in the Lord like three or four times in our texts. Stand firm. You're in Christ. Uh, therefore, in verse 1, what does therefore point to? Verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Big things like God's coming back and he's going to make all things new and he's going to re redeem these bodies and make them like Jesus' redeemed one. And so I just, big things. Stand firm. Massive. And then in verse 2, you got two ladies fighting. I urge Yudia and Sinteke to live in harmony in the Lord. Don't you feel sorry for those ladies? I mean, it's 2,000 years later, and we're still hearing about their fight. <laughs> That's encouragement. Why are they fighting? It's real easy. You're looking at lesser things than these big foundational bedrock things. You're, you're making smaller things ultimate. Your eyes are on your hurts, not the king and his kingdom and what he's doing. You're quarreling over things that are going to perish. Molehills in light of the 
Mount Everest of Romans 11, for from him, through him, and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. A small argument. And Paul brings the whole eternity to bear on this mundane thing. It's just, it, it's awesome. Counselors, take note. Paul doesn't say, hey, ladies, here's Paul Tripp's five steps to reconciliation. Go to peacemakers, let them fix this. He just says, lift your eyes back up to your harmony. Is that you're going to be glorified together and you're going to worship Jesus forever. Look back, lift your eyes, get back on that. Remember that we count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And, he's, and I love verse 9, Philippians 3, 9, that we might be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. You stand before God in a righteousness not your own that's been given to you by Jesus Christ. Quit quarreling. Look at what you have. The Lord is near. His second coming. He's coming. He's right on the doorstep. Lift your eyes. Don't get petty. Lift your eyes to the king. Hold that up to conflict that you're having this morning. That's how Paul deals with it. When we take our eyes off of Jesus... This whole plan of God to our little kingdom, we start quarreling. And it becomes ultimate, and the greatest reality of the world is my personal hurt. It's like arguing over who gets the last scoop of Brussels sprouts when you got a filet mignon on your plate. <laughs> this is how you stand firm. You live by faith in what we saw in Romans 8. Can any Baptist yell amen? amen? We got some. We got some. You live into these things. And then in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always and again. I'll say rejoice. You're in Christ and you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look again. Rejoice in the Lord. Keep rejoicing in what you have in Christ. Well, what happens when you don't live into these big, huge, redemptive promises that we've been learning? Well, your kingdom and your rights, your treatment by others, what you deserve, that will become supreme. And now you'll fight for your rights. And you know the, the term I like, you'll become a gnarly dude. And you will retaliate. You'll take people down with your tongue and you'll slander. You'll pay back evil for evil. You'll snub. You'll avoid. You'll make sure you know they know you despise them. But when you live into these big, beautiful, redemptive truths where you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You fight for the Lord's name and not your own. You forbear and you're gracious and you're patient when you're wrong. And you say stuff like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do instead of canceling them. And I want you to listen hard to this. You have to be stable in unstable times. And these big gospel truths will make us stable with unstable people, and it will make us forbearing. Philippians 4, 5. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. That is what God wants me to be known for. You don't understand, Pastor. I'm reformed. <laughs> yeah. I cleaned temples. Jesus cleaned temples. He didn't say, you guys, please pick up your birds and lambs and set them free. He turned him over. He kicked him over. I want to walk in his footsteps. I just want you to know I love zeal. We need zeal. The church has lost zeal. But it's got to be in the right direction. In the wrong direction, I want you to hear this. You could actually be doing more to tear down the kingdom of God than to build it up with all of your zeal. More to hurt it than to build it up. I hear well-meaning talk shows and sermons tackling this in the flesh. Instead of speaking the truth in love, we smash them, we humiliate them, we show them how stupid they are, but it's because I love them and I embarrass them and I want to destroy them. The next generation takes it to another degree, um, especially children. If you act this way, wait till you see how your children will respond to you one day. Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are those who are meek. He was led to the slaughter as a sheep and he was silent before his shears. 
He uttered no threats. And here's Paul with more zeal than any of us combined in this room, said this is what we're to be known for. And so I'll ask you again, what are you known for? Is it a forbearing spirit? Paul is telling us that this spirit will produce one who stands firm. And so my question is, why will that produce that? How will this produce one who's steadfast and stable? It seems to me it would produce the opposite. It feels to me like be flimsy. You don't get firmness out of flimsy. Let's take a look at this word and see if we, it won't give us some clarity as to how this will produce stability in your life. I believe it will bless you and show you clearly how this will produce stability. So what would God like Southside Bible Church to be known for? Let's look in verse 5. To all men. First off, this is to be public, conspicuous. It's what comes to people's mind when they hear your name. It's how people describe you. It's not a personality. It's a grace that can abide in all temperaments and personalities. I had a guy one time, he, before he laid out this lady on the phone, he goes, look, I'm Italian. Like, okay, so now you can be rude and kick and yell and scream because you're Italian? Stop. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's to be known. It's an experiential knowledge. It's gained by perception. People observing you and watching you in hard times. These are people who watch you day in and day out at the ball fields, schools, jobs, neighborhoods, families, churches. <clears throat> Those who see when things don't go your way. I'm the nicest guy until things don't go my way. They observe your life, how you respond to people, circumstances that are challenging. And this is what all men are to get by watching your life. You're different. You have peace, you have trust, and you have hope past circumstances and past people. This is where we're set apart. This is beautiful. You're different. What is it to be forbearing then? Freiburg says it's gentleness or forbearance. J.B. Phillips so it's to have a reputation for being reasonable. What, how does that fit America? You're reasonable. What does that mean? You, you can actually hear another argument besides your own. You, you get locked in on the way you think, what you believe, what you want, and no one can break in. So it's actually reasonable. And King James is interesting. It's moderation, which means... You know, I thought that was just with food and drink and all these other things. This is moderation as a self-restraint in our dealings with others. We just don't let them have it. We have a self-restraint. Uh, it's not being mean-spirited, revengeful, critical, or judgmental. It carries the idea, I love this, bearing troubles calmly. Lenski, the commentator, said it has the idea of yielding not insisting on your own rights. The Septuagint uses it for God's kindness. It's kind of a hard word to translate in one word, but I'm going to try to narrow down all my study on it, is a sense of sweet reasonableness, big-heartedness, charity towards the faults of others, bearing with all wrongs that are done to you. John MacArthur said it's graciousness. It's a graciousness. And I would say one step further, it's the graciousness of humility. So we're to be known as those who are gracious in humility. A good translation of our verse before us would be this. Let your humble graciousness be known by all men. The bottom line then is it's, it can't be about you and your rights and your kingdom and your plans and your entitlements you're gracious towards others because of the grace that you've received from Christ. Faults, wrongdoings towards you, weaknesses, wrong statements, wrong actions, anything that punches at you gets graciousness and response. Is that a day in America? It's hard to define, but you know when you see it, don't you? I, I always call him out. I hate to do it, but my brother Steve is my example in this. 
And I'll, I'll never forget when he got saved with six gnarly unsaved brothers and he'd come over for dinner and we'd be like, pass the, we'd cuss, you know, the milk and do whatever we could and, and, and just trying to cook his grits and he just would drop his head and pray and pray and he ne- we could never get him. And it just, I glorified God on the day of my visitation because of that. And then the other example I want to bring up, I don't even know if he's here, uh, Ray I won't say his last name since we're live streaming, but you know Ray if you know him. And when Ray showed up 30 years ago, Ray was a gnarly dude. And now after 30 years of being put on the anvil, he has this deep graciousness (laughs) and trust now. And so I wanted you to have a gnarly dude and Steve Murphy and, and just look and say, this is what you're to be known for I don't care what your personality trait is. This is what God will be refining and doing in your life. Paul puts this in an imperative. It's actually a command. We're, we're being commanded to be known for this. It's what's called an heiress, and it, it's an inceptive, which means it stresses the beginning of an action or the entrance into a state to, to begin, to enter in to being forbearing with all men. And so we're, we're to bear our troubles calmly by rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The one rejoicing in Christ, not always run by your circumstances, just being grumpy, crotchety old guy. Have you ever heard that saying, you know, I don't want to be that guy? That's that guy. You're just always upset, bothered, bugged, life's bad, and, and you're just that guy. Just some honest examination before the Lord. Is that me? We got enough time. I want to look at the analogy of Scripture to just show you how common this is in the Bible. Let's just flip around. Get your Bibles open. (coughs) Turn to Titus, a few books forward, Titus chapter (coughs) 3. We'll look at a few of these verses, and then I'll pretty much finish up for you. Pretty much. Verse 1 of Titus, chapter 3. Remind them to be subject to rulers and to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one. Here's our idea, to be peaceable and gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves and disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us from that kind of person, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. There are those big, profound truths whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, and strife, and disputes about the law, For they're they're unprofitable and worthless, and there may be some of you this morning that that's all you do. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 30, and it's an interesting connection. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How do I grieve the Holy Spirit? I need the Holy Spirit for everything that I do, anything spiritual or godly. I need the Spirit. And now we're being commanded, don't grieve Him, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How do I grieve Him? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. That's how you grieve Him but rather be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, forbearing with each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. 
You're going to grieve the Spirit of God as you treat and act this way. Rather be like Christ. Flip over to James 3. I'm sure the young disciples have already been through this. Where are you guys at? James, are you still in it? Oh, right here? Who's teaching it next? Are you teaching 3, 13 through 18? Oh, when? Do you want to come up? <laughs> I said, preach it. James 3, 13, who among you is wise and understanding? Who's godly? Let him show by his good behavior and deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, which was going on with Yudi and Sintike, uh, and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it's earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and gentle, and here's our word, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So uh, Friday night at 7 o'clock, come here, Keegan, teach on that. I want you to see, there it is. You have reasonableness, gentleness, and, and wisdom, and peace. That's the one who has wisdom and is being led by the Spirit of God. Uh, write down in your notes 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25, and 3, 8 through 12. I'm going to skip them. So my question, simply, does that describe you? Is that what you're known for? One pastoral observation, the one who is not forbearing, their life is unstable. I've watched it. When you're not characterized by this, you, you have fighting in your home, in your church, at work, with neighbors. It's just, it's not peaceable. It's just, all it brings is brokenness and conflicts, and don't you ever get tired of it? This whole world is so wrong. They're all so broken. <laughs> it's not me. It's everybody, it's everybody else. And it's all I do. Is you're, you're, you're not going to have a stable life. I love, as we move into Romans 9, George Whitfield and, and Charles Wesley are, are battling over sovereignty and whether God isn't. Wesley's more Arminian and, and uh, Whitfield's Calvinistic. And I mean, they were just faithful going and battling in the word to try to settle this understanding from scripture. And I, I highly love that. We should get truth and study it and try to come to conclusions. But when Whitfield was asked one day, do you think you'll even see Wesley in heaven? Like, if he believes that, do you think he'll even be in heaven? And his answer was, I, I, don't think, I don't think so. I won't be able to see him because he'll be so close to the throne of God, I won't be able to see him from where I'm at. That's the spirit I want to see through Romans 9 through 11 in this church. Would a forbearing spirit describe how you deal with Arminians or people who have a different view on Israel's future and God's plan? Paul was just to get in your face kind of guy, right? Yet he's unflinching in the truth and unswerving in his devotion to Christ. And he's the one telling us, you need to be forbearing. He's the one who said, without love, I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. He says, I entreat you as a father. First Thessalonians 2, 7, I prove to be gentle among you as a nursing motherly, mother tenderly cares for her children. 1 Thessalonians 2.8, having a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you have become so very dear to us. 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. How did Christ describe himself to entice sinners to come? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Are we approachable like Christ? Our gospel is offensive, but are we? Do we have a meekness that men want to come to us? 
What is, what's your best apologetic in evangelism? I'm going to say a forbearing spirit. Let it be known by all men the graciousness of how we journey this life and conflicts and the things that come into our life. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, this is harder than Philippians 4.4, 4, to rejoice in the Lord always, because that is to look to Christ. He says, this is saying, look like Christ. Go live like him and look like him in this world. What would those who know us characterize us by? Are you willing to yield where your interests are concerned, not the truth, your interests? Or is it I, I, I? It's amazing what this could do for your marriages. I think of Abraham and Lot when they're having that strife between their herdsmen. Genesis 13, 8, Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. It's not, the whole, it's not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. If to the left, then I'll go to the right. If to the right, then I'll go to the left. Abraham's the older brother. He, he, he has the right to do whatever he wants. And here's that forbearing spirit. We're brothers. Let's not fight. So it's not a, about me fighting for my due. Do I, do I need to remind you what is your due? You deserve wrath. And you got grace. And we've been looking at that grace unbelievable grace. Though my sins, they were many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. You must be gentle, humble, gracious people. We're not, we can't be those kind of people where everyone's like, well, stay away from him. Kids, be careful. Dad's a little bit grumpy today. He's just a little bit touchy. He, not irritable. We're always getting upset. Those with such big feet that someone steps on them every day. We're living minefields we should not be easily offended. We're forbearing because, quite frankly, it's not about us anymore. It's about God and his name. And I've told you about this Puritan so many times, but I will remind you again of Thomas Cramner. And Thomas Cramner had a saying about him, and it said, if you want a favor from Cramner, go do him an insult. Go wrong Cramner, and then he'll really love you. He'll come after you, and he'll reach out. Is that our culture? <laughs> Some of you might just be like, that is, I, I just think that's garbage. I want you to look at this Bible, and I want to be known. If anyone wants a favor from Ken Murphy, go do him a wrong. Having this spirit, I want you to hear this, will make you stable in these days. Wrong treatment, lies, slander, humiliation, mistreatment, messed up government, whatever it is, it will not knock you off your course. You can't get this person distracted with a good fight because he's too busy fighting the good fight of faith. And you know who I counsel most often is people who lack this. They're unstable because every little offense puts them in a tailspin. And that could be the aroma of your marriage and your home. So what do I do? What do I do then with all my anxieties and stresses in this world and this life and everything that's coming at me. How do I be forbearing? You tried my schedule for a day and you'd grump at your wife too. You know, how do I deal with all that? Well, Paul answers it. If you'll look with me, go back to Philippians. <coughs> this will be our closing, pretty much our closing statement. I only got a quarter of a page left after this. Verse 6. So let your gentle spirit be known by all men. Man, the Lord's coming. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And for me, when I'm having these anxieties and these stresses, um, praying um, sometimes doesn't cure it. And sometimes when I give thanksgiving, it doesn't work. I'll be like, God, thank you for a warm house. Will you help me with my anxiety of this guy who's attacking me right now? And it doesn't work. So I keep thanking him. It says, do it with thanksgiving. And if we keep thanking him, maybe it'll, it'll help. And I think I finally got it. It took me 30 years you can tell me afterwards, I'm sure you will, but do it forbearingly when you come up to talk with me. I, I think with Thanksgiving is that what we learned in Romans 8 
God's working everything for good in my life. He, everything, when I come and pray, I, I like what Newton said, everything that God's, God lets through into my life is necessary and everything he doesn't isn't necessary. And so as I start bringing my anxieties, it's, it's bringing me in prayer, coming back to God, presenting my request. But what I'm thanking him is, I know you got me. I know you're conforming my life to Christ. I'm reminding myself of Romans 8.28. There's, there's a God who's working and all these anxieties are his gift to come and sanctify and grow me. And his answer to this prayer is going to be perfect. The Spirit's going to intercede and it's going to be effectual. Jesus is going to pray from heaven and it will happen. And all of a sudden my heart starts calming because I'm giving him thanks that he has me and he's sanctifying me and he's working me for, for good. And that all of a sudden just brings peace. That passes all understanding. I can't even figure out why. I just know God's my father and I'm safe and I trust what he's doing and I'm bringing these things. It it's absolutely will guard your mind and your heart and bring peace. That's for free. That brings stability. I heard a preacher once say, then, then you'll be a rock because you're hidden in the rock of ages. And so that's where we're going to find our stability in, in Christ. And so may this be the aroma by God's grace of Southside Bible Church because many will come to Christ as we live this out in our midst. And maybe take some time to examine this about yourself. This is bigger than a Super Bowl. Try to get to the root. Why am I like this? Why am I so troubled? What's bothering me so much? And come pour some really big gospel truths and realities on this weed that's growing in your heart. And keep praying and seeking the Spirit to bear this in your heart and life until you are known for a forbearing spirit. And all men will know you by your forbearing spirit. And so I pray that for everyone in this room. Let's, let's go to our God. Father, I pray that for each and every one of us. We want to grow and become more and more like this. I really do want to be known. If you want a favor from me, just do me a wrong, and then I'll really love you instead of canceling. God, we've been so affected by our culture. Let this be a season right now of corporate repentance. Corporate repentance for letting this world influence us and to always be disturbed and always bothered and just walking away from people and not hoping and believing and forbearing and love that never fails because it comes from Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. God, I pray that you would make us into these kind of men, women, and children, that that is what we would be known for, this deep, humble graciousness because that is our Savior. And I pray, Lord, that we will now enter in and that we will be stable because we don't get flipped around by circumstances or by people. Difficult circumstances and difficult people don't flip us because of this beautiful gospel and what we have in Christ. So God, make us steadfast, anchor us in this beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray this in his precious, sweet, beautiful name. Amen.